listening to the Virtual CISO Podcast. Providing the best insight on information security and security IT advice to business leaders everywhere. Uh, hey there, and welcome to yet another episode of the Virtual CISO Podcast. With you as always, John Ver, your host, and with you, me, today, is Jack Liljeberg. Hey, Jack. How's it going, everyone? Uh, thanks for coming on. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about who you are and what is it that you do every day? Yeah, absolutely. So I work for Thompson Flanagan uh, and our lawyers professional group. Um, and I work with a team of uh, brokers that work on primarily professional liability insurance for law firms. And me specifically, I work on cyber insurance for law firms, uh, as well as a couple other lines of insurance. Uh, but cyber is definitely the, the main point. Uh, been working for Thompson Flanagan the last two years. Um, kind of been through the ups and flows of uh, the cyber market, so I definitely feel like I've learned a ton in those, those two years. And um, yeah, that's that's pretty much my, my background in insurance. Sounds good. And and cyber insurance is definitely why you're here to chat. So looking forward to it. Um, always ask, uh, what's your drink of choice? My drink of choice. Mm-hmm. Um. If I had to get, I mean, I would say maybe a margarita. Love a nice yeah. margarita. Uh, you, do you go uh, mezcal in there at all? Get get a little smoky, get a little interesting? I do like, yeah, I do like the smoky. Love a nice little spicy margarita. Yeah, it's it's always nice and refreshing, especially when the weather's getting a little nicer. All right. And, and is there, it, uh, I drink everything. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> and is there a, a specific um, a specific tequila that you use your uh, go-to? Casamigos. Or whatever. Yes. Casamigos. Yeah. yeah. Casamigos is the best. Yeah, right. That's That's so uh, that's That's uh, what's his name? Isn't it George? Um, the, the, George the Clooney. Actor. George Clooney. Yeah. That's Clooney's, right? Yeah, it's really exactly. good. I, I, we, we bought it as a, as a gift for someone. It was We were trying to figure out between that and Patron, and we ended up with the Casamigos. And I said, well, I should buy a bottle for myself so I can see what it's like if I'm going to give it as a gift. And it was, it was quite good. I think I got the uh, Anejo, yeah. uh, which there was really qu- quite nice. Yeah. yeah, that's good stuff. Yeah, good stuff. So in talking with customers, I'm, I'm definitely hearing a lot of complaints about their CLI premiums um, getting quite expensive, you know, hundreds of percent, 200 percent, 300 percent increases, or even, you know, having trouble finding good coverage. I'm also talking to some friends in the insurance side and hear that some insurers are dropping CLI coverage altogether. Um, what are you what are you seeing right now? Yeah, I mean, I think definitely when I when I first started, premiums um, were skyrocketing. I think it was we were seeing any, anywhere from 60 to 200%, sometimes maybe like 400% increases in premium. Um, it was definitely a lot more tough last year than this year. I think this year you can definitely tell the market's stabilized. Um, pricing is it's a little bit easier to find. Um, and especially in the law firm space, I think um, a lot of the firms did not have the proper controls that they needed last year. And where we kind of had to push them to put in MFA, um, find an EDR solution, et cetera. Um, and I think a lot of our firms have the proper controls this year or at least meet the minimum requirements. Um, so I think pricing has been a little bit better and, and through kind of an influx of, of uh, carriers in the, mu- in the market, we're, we're able to negotiate price. So um, I've, I've been a little more confident in, in our, our selling abilities this year. So you're, you're so you're seeing it's it's getting better, not getting worse. Because I'm still here, I'm still hearing some pretty ugly stories. Yeah, no, I think it, it really depends. I, I know, I mean, if a firm has had a, a large ransomware claim or data breach in the last uh, two years or so, it's it's definitely tough to find a carrier that's willing to provide all the the necessary limits for the price that we want. Um, but if we have a firm that has all the the proper security controls and hasn't had any incidents. Um, I, I we're comfortable in our ability to, to sell on behalf of the firm. Gotcha. And then in terms of like, so when we go back to this point where we see saw this um, ramp in premiums, um, did, did the insurance companies get themselves into trouble by you know I've heard people say it was well they, you know they were it was a buy market share grab or certainly I know that there was not a lot of underwriting being done. Uh, are those the reasons why we saw premiums at, at one point that were so cheap, you were like, you'd be foolish not to take them. And then all of a sudden saw that, that big jump and escalation of premiums. 
Yeah, I think I think my understanding. So when I when I first started broking, I I was kind of in the hard market, but I didn't really get to experience the the soft market or the one that was so easy to find coverage. But my understanding is, I guess underwriting wasn't really happening then. It was kind of more just a a side policy that was easy to add on top of a lawyer's professional policy or, or something something of that nature. Um, and now with, with the influx of ransomware claims, I think people had to start taking it more seriously and these carriers were getting hit pretty hard. Um, so I think the only way they could uh, stay afloat is to increase premiums, increase gotcha. retention, limit coverage. So, so. Yeah, so, you know, I, 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 I've noticed, right, that I, I think there is more diligence being done. We can argue that it's still not quite enough maybe, uh, but they're definitely doing more diligence and they're asking a lot more questions and the questions they're asking are a lot sharper and a lot more uh, specific. Do you find that right. there are certain controls, existence or lack thereof, that would impact premiums more than other controls? You know, for example, you mentioned MFA, or uh, maybe they're not encrypting data, or maybe they're not encrypting backups, or maybe they don't have backups, or, you know, or so are more, are certain controls more impactful to somebody's cyber liability insurance premium? And if so, what are they, you know, because then our clients that are listening to this would know you know, which ones they should probably prioritize if they're seeking a better CLI. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I, I would say MFA is, is the biggest one by far. Um, if you don't have any multi-factor authentication to access your computer in and out of the office, um, it's gonna be really hard to find coverage at all. Um, that's become a minimum requirement for many of our markets. Um, if we're working with a, a very small law firm, we're usually able to maybe to get, get by without it. Um, but I would say that's probably the minimum requirement that we're seeing. Um, I, I know like a an EDR solution, employee detection response can be expensive, um, but when our carriers see our law firms carrying that, it really, it really does help um, with our ability to negotiate price. Um, and I've definitely seen that, that trend so far in the last couple of months. What about, I, I would assume, good offsite backups have to be something important as well, right? Because the biggest thing that yeah. you know, one of the biggest things they're concerned about is ransomware. And that is absolutely the best uh, approach to mitigating the overall risk associated with uh, ransomware. Right. Yeah. Offsite backups, encrypted, um, MFA backing it up as well. I think all, all those are really important as well. Um, that, yeah, I mean, I, I get, that would definitely be somewhat of a minimal requirement in itself. I, th I, th I feel like most most companies are, are, are good about having that in place. Gotcha. And if, and if I were going to look at, you know, uh, the applications for the Beasleys and the AWACS and the Zurichs mm -hmm. and everybody of that nature, uh, consistently we're going to see those specific <laughs> questions on their, on their questionnaires? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I have definitely seen um, the, the Beasleys access um, uh, made the bigger carriers uh, really revamping their applications. Um, and there's just so many more specific questions that are asked now. Um, it's been a little bit harder of a uh, conversation with our, our law firm clients that maybe aren't super excited to fill out these large applications. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it it's just kind of the, the world we live in now. Yeah, it's, it's sort of table stakes, right? Right, exactly. Uh, so in terms of the, going back to these applications, um, have you seen insurers um, beginning to request compliance with standards? Um, for, for example, uh, in the defense industrial base, are they asking about in the state of a CMMC or in healthcare, do they ask about HIPAA? Yeah, definitely. Uh, if you're HIPAA um, is certified, I believe that's, that's what it is. Um, they definitely ask about that. Um, I, yeah, I, I wouldn't say that's necessarily the make or make or break of the application process. But um, in my experience, I guess I haven't really uh, ran, run into that as, as much. Um, what about, you know, what about privacy standards now, right? So as an example with GDPR, um, you know, an organization can be fined, you know, what is it, 4% of their annual revenue in a worst case. And I think as of, I think this morning or yesterday morning, right? Didn't Google just get fined, I don't know, $1.3 billion or something nuts of that nature. Um, so I guess two questions there. Do most cyber liability insurance policies cover privacy issues of that nature? Uh, and if so, 
uh, I would assume that they're going to start to ask for evidence of some level of compliance, you know, with the with the privacy standards like GDPR and CCPA. Yeah, usually there's an endorsement that would be added to the policy that would provide coverage for that, um, as well as I mean, there's going to be some sort of compliance issues when it comes to that. Um, yeah, and I, I think that's something to look look for in the, in the next couple months as well, especially with the stuff you're talking about. Um, people getting fined and yeah, no, I, I'd imagine that's, that's definitely going to be a topic. Gotcha. And when you say an endorsement, is an endorsement an additional coverage? So in other words, if I buy cyber liability insurance to, you know, to cover what I would consider to be a normal breach, um, do I need to pay additional, you know, uh, you know, do, do I need to pay additional for that endorsement to cover me from a privacy perspective or is that part and parcel of the CLI policy? Uh, that's going to be just part of the policy. Okay. Yeah, it's, and it's going to be a standard policy, standard endorsement that we're going to see on a lot of our, a lot of our main uh, carriers. We'll have it on there for no uh, additional. Yeah, then I, I, yeah, then I find it hard to believe that they're not going to really like that. That's not going to be the next big thing that they're asking for, is because you know when they start seeing uh, numbers of that nature, you know that's that's right. a staggering number. Exactly. Right? And no insurance, no insurance <laughs> entity that I know of wants to be on the hook for that. Right. Exactly. What about, um, so, so, you know, I asked you about specific standards there. Um, but what about more, what I'm going to call comprehensive third party attestation standards? Uh, are you seeing them ask for things like ISO 27001 or SOC 2? Uh, or if they have an ISO 27001 or SOC 2, uh, do you find that it's going to be easier for them to get insurance and that the likelihood that their premiums are going to be a little bit lower based on that? Yeah, no, I think that definitely helps to have. I don't think it's going to be something that is make or break coming back to that. Um, I think a lot of my my clients will be like small to mid-sized law firms. Um, so I think it's not necessarily a, a question they're really going to dive deep into, but <clears throat> it definitely helps with premium reduction as well. I mean, if they're certified in that sense and they're really – obviously care about their cybersecurity, um, that's always going to help and then pushing for, for a lower premium. Um, so, you know, one of the questions I've been asked by, by people, of course, is that the fill, you know, Hey, can you help me fill out this application or can, can we talk about this application and what should I answer here? Um, so what happens or what are the implications, if you will, if a client is, you know, intentionally inaccurate or unintentionally accurate in their application and there's some type of an incident? Yeah, I always I've, I've been pushing my my firms to just send their application to their IT because they're going to know exactly how to fill it out. Um, make sure we're we're there. There isn't any errors, you know, in their application. Um, especially if they're a lot of a lot of these policies will have certain language in them. And if you say if you don't have MFA and you say you do, they're not going to cover a claim. Um, so we're always going to want to make sure that we're providing with the most up-to-date information about our law firm clients, um, what controls they have, and making sure we're being honest when we're um, submitting the application. Uh, honest, uh, that makes complete sense. What about explicit, right? So, you know, like within MFA or within endpoint protection, some of the things you talked about, right, there are different levels of things that you, one might do uh, in the ways things might be configured. Um, how explicit do you think people should be in their applications? I think the more explicit you can be, I think the more helpful it is. Um, the more you can provide detail on your, on your controls. I mean, that just makes you, the client, the candidate look look better to the carrier. Um, yeah, I, I think the more detail you can add, the better. Um, and I guess I guess that would also protect you in, in the event of an incident. Um, right. You know, because... If, if something was configured a certain way where it could have been configured better, uh, and, and, you know, where they might have a, a, an ability to turn around and say, hey, you know, you're not really covered because you didn't have that configured right. But if you had specified that configuration, that would probably protect you. Yeah, definitely. No, I totally agree with what you're saying. I think we always try to push on uh, detail. And coming back to what I was saying before, the applications being so much more specific, um, just the more detail you can provide is the better. Gotcha. Um, you know, I, I usually 
you know, because we get asked a lot about cyber liability insurance. You know, I usually tell clients to be careful of potential gotchas. Uh, for example, exemptions and coverage. Um, I, get, I would guess that some of the same gotchas can also be a strategy for reducing costs. So, you know, in terms of th those types of issues, um, any any thoughts, any ideas, any advice? Um, I guess I'm a little confused what you're what you're asking, man. Well, so so as an example, we had a, a client years ago that was had coverage for a database that had uh, they specifically were covering it for a particular database that was in a senior housing uh, facility, and there was an exemption for any database with above fifty thousand records, and that database had fifty six thousand records in it. So the specific reason they bought the cyber liability insurance coverage in the event of a breach would not have been covered, right? Because it was an exemption and they had done a bad job of reading it. So there's a gotcha on that side. And then I was just wondering if, you know, A, are there other gotchas that people should look forward, right? Some of these, these exemptions. Well, let's start with that. Are there other things that you would counsel someone to make sure that they're looking at or what, what section of the, the cyber liability insurance policy they should be looking at to make sure that they understand what is and what isn't covered? For sure. I think one... One aspect of the policy to always look at is um, the cyber crime limits. Um, that's been a huge talking point over the last couple of years. Um, back in the day, it would be pretty easy to find coverage for social engineering, funds transfer fraud. Uh, I think now these days, every cyber carrier uh, is supplementing it. Um, you want to make sure you're looking in the forms and endorsements. Um, make sure that it's actually covering a social engineering incident as well, because most funds transfer incidents, you know, result from a social engineering attack. Um, so I think it's always important to look at that language, make sure it's it's actually covering the that incident. Um, I, I've seen a couple couple claims go bad where maybe they, they weren't covering social engineering, but we thought, not, not me specifically, but we thought that we it was being covered and um, claiming I ended up not being uh, and I'm not paying for the claim. So I think that's something to really look forward to or look at because um, that can get a little tricky. Uh, is there any other language to look for? Like I, you know, like I've in, in certain contracts, we'll see maybe not necessarily cyber liability insurance, but we'll see things like um, uh, industry best, you know, systems should be protected reasonably and appropriately or in accordance with industry best practice. Um, terms of that nature that you see in contracts that people should be aware of? Um, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not actually really sure about that. I, I would have to look into that more. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not really sure. Sorry. No, no worries. Um, so, you know, I've, I've had the misfortune of reviewing cyber policies on behalf of clients and they're certainly complex and increasingly legalese. Um, so what percentage of companies that you guys work with have their policies reviewed by a cyber liability insurance knowledgeable attorney? And uh, what percent should have their, those contracts reviewed? Yeah, I, I would say um, when, it, when it comes to our smaller, maybe smaller law firms, small to mid size, uh, I don't think most of the time they're getting reviewed um, by by their own attorneys. Um, I know our, our our big law firm clients that we work with always do that. Um, I think that's best practice. I think it's always good to get a second eyes on on the, the policy. Make sure nothing's missed. Um, we always try to do our best and make sure there's no gaps in coverage. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think it's always a good idea to to get a second eye on on your uh, your policy. Yeah, gotcha. So so it, so in general, your recommendation would be is if you if you are buying cyber liability insurance and it's and you you probably better off having a, some form of legal review just to make sure that you know you have or or minimally, maybe not legal review or a legal review by somebody who's familiar with those types of policies or understands insurance coverage, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, absolutely. We work with lawyers so that they are used to reading um, policies, contracts, but uh, someone that actually maybe works in that space, you know, it'd be good to get someone to look at that. So you, you kind of touched on this a, a second ago. So cyber liability is part of a broader umbrella of insurance coverages and you mentioned crime and DNO, et cetera. Um, how can somebody determine whether they have gaps in their coverage or they're overinsured? Like who should, who should be reviewing that? Is that the broker? Because like I've seen situations where 
as an example, somebody thought they could process a claim on the cyber liability insurance policy, but it was a laptop that had been stolen and it should have been covered by the crime policy. And they were underinsured on the crime policy. So, and that was what ended up paying, as I recall. Yeah, no, I think that definitely should be a broker. Um, I think a sign of a good broker is knowing where there where there is gaps in your coverage or where you're over over insured. Um, kind of coming back to the, the what you said about crime. Like I, I've been pushing all of my my clients this year to buy a, a crime policy just because it's somewhat uh, easier to get. Um, less less costly and it does provide that that full limit for um cyber crime which is uh sublimited usually on a cyber policy um so i think that's when thinking about cyber coverage it's always good to, to have that crime too especially if um because that's that's where the actual financial loss you know is going to be going to be covered uh, any other uh, types of um insurance coverages that you should be looking at in combination with your cyber liability insurance policy? Um, I think if, if you're a technology based company, you should look at some cyber and tech, you know, um, me personally, I don't work on that a ton just cause I, a lot of our law firm companies aren't really tech based. Um, but I, I know that that is something that a lot of carriers will offer tech, you know, with the cyber, um, and you know, just for, for, for people is errors and omissions, correct? Correct. Yes. Okay. So you're saying like, if you're a SAS as an example, so far as a service provider that, that, that tech, you know, would be something that would be important to look at. Yes, totally agree. Um, me personally, I don't have a ton of experience with that, so I wouldn't be good at speaking to it, but, um, I definitely have seen a lot of, a lot of policies where that has been added. Sounds good. Um, you beat this up pretty good. Anything we missed? Uh, I don't think so. I, I know uh, maybe one other point I would say about different policies, like a professional liability policy, you always want to be looking if make sure um, that it's not, or check if it is excluding a cyber incident. Um, and, you know, a lot of DNO policies the same way, they will exclude cyber incidents. So if you think you have coverage on your professional liability policy, you should always be looking to make sure you have a, a separate cyber because usually it will be excluded. Cool. Um, I didn't, uh, I didn't know that. So that's helpful. Uh, so, uh, Jack, thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. If folks want to get in contact with you, what's the easiest way to do that? Yeah. So you can send, uh, always send a question to my email, which is J, uh, Liljeberg. It's L I L J E B E R G at Thompson Flanagan dot com. Um, and my cell phone number is six, three, zero, two, four, zero, zero, seven, seven, six. So, Always feel free to just shoot me a call if you have a question. Awesome. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, John. Appreciate it.